Hi, uh, I'm Larry Coley, uh, 1969 St. Mike. Tonight we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the 1961 Majors Buzzers Joint Championship seasons. The 60-61 season was special in many ways, including the hockey championships of the Buzzers and Majors, but for other hockey teams at the school, including the Bantams. Also in 1960, the arena opened with a game between the majors and alumni all-stars refereed by none other than Rocket Richard and King Clancy. Get ready tonight for many special guests from the majors and buzzers storied history. And the music you heard as we came on was the of course McNamara's band, which would often greet the majors and buzzers before each game. First, let me talk to you about the format. You've all been invited via the StreamYards platform in which our moderator will interview players from that era. This is being recorded and using that platform, we can also show rare game highlights. Afterwards, we will switch the Zoom platform in which you can interact with our guests and ask questions or get answers for questions that have already been submitted. That should happen around 8.30 p.m. First, I want to acknowledge the magnificent committee that put this program together from St. Mike's staff today. I'd like to acknowledge our quarterback and leader, Stephanie Nichols, the advancement officer and alumni and special events, the technical wizardry of Stephen Klein, the theater manager, and Alex Frescura, our great athletic director. The second group that's assisting with this is uh, from the Hockey Time Machine online weekly program which is broadcast worldwide and was recently profiled in the New York Times. Those include Paul Pascu, hockey historian and video archivist, who has provided us with these rare clips you will soon see. Also, we're helped by supervising producer Laura Evans and executive producer Glenn Dreyfus, who is facilitating this program all the way from Seattle, Washington. Finally, there's the friends and alumni of St. Mike's. There's Joe Yonder, from the Double Blue Alumni Association and a longtime teacher and friend of the school. Father Jim Crothers told me once that Joe bleeds double blue. Then we have Peter Philman, the curator of the St. Michael's Wall of Fame at the arena and historian of all things St. Mike's and myself. I also wanna acknowledge that this event is being dedicated to honor the memory of those who helped me put together many hockey history celebrations over the years from 2002 until 2019. Those include Jim Gregory, who was the manager of that 61 team and the Great Leaf teams of the 70s. Dan Nicholson, a beloved teacher and hockey mentor at St. Mike's for many years. And Dr. Eugene Willis, hockey historian extraordinaire. We will all miss you very much. Now I want to introduce the moderator for tonight's show. We are very lucky indeed to have Steve, Steve Pakin, host not only of the Agenda on TVO, but a prol prol prolific author of nine books including the definitive works on William Davis and John Robarts. Now I turn it over to Steve, who's not only the chronicler of Ontario Public Affairs, but our very own homegrown Walter Cronkite, who's also a true hockey knight. So take it away, Steve. Larry, that's very funny. And thank you very much for that introduction. This promises to be just an incredibly nostalgic evening, ladies and gentlemen. 184 St. Mike's players have gone to the National Hockey League, 14 have been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and we are going to lead off with one of them tonight. How's this for a start? We're gonna start with plain and simple, the greatest Maple Leaf of all time. Calder Trophy, Lady Bing Trophy, Conn Smythe Trophy, four-time Stanley Cup champion, Hockey Hall of Fame, 1,600 games in the NHL and the WHA, 500 goals, almost 1,300 points, and it all started at St. Mike's. Four seasons with St. Michael's College, both with the buzzers and the majors. Ladies and gentlemen, Davey Keon. Davey Keon, this is a, a, a real tremendous honor for me, and I'm so glad that you could make some time for us tonight. I wonder if you could start by telling us how a kid out of Naranda, Quebec, ends up in Midtown Toronto playing at St. Michael's. How did that happen? Well, um, I had gone to Hamilton training camp uh, when I was 15 and um, they had uh, they had said I could play junior B in Burlington, but that uh, wasn't going to happen with my parents. So the next year uh, I ended up being on the LEAF uh, list and um, I was offered the chance to come to, to go to St. Michael's and my parents were very happy that uh, 
I was going to be there and live as a boarder and uh, be taken care of. Be uh, the Brazilians would uh, be taking care of my life. Your first cousin, some people may not know, was Todd Sloan, who played eight or nine seasons with the Maple Leafs and also went to St. Mike's. Was he at all influential in your decisions or in giving you advice at the time? No, I hadn't met I hadn't met Todd until I till I w went to Toronto. Um, and then uh, I met him and uh, I spoke to him and uh, he just encouraged me to, uh, you know, to, not to give up or, you know, to keep working at it. How much of the legacy of St. Mike's, and by that I mean, you know, Ted Lindsay, Tim Horton, Red Kelly, how much of all that did you know when you got there? Well, I knew some of it. Uh, I knew that their junior team was, their, 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 the hockey program was very good. Plus, I think um, that it was a place where uh, hockey players from Catholic families, they could go and their parents knew that they would be staying in residence and there would be guidelines and rules and you were going to have to go to school. I think um, when the, the majors got out of hockey, uh, after the Memorial Cup in 61, I think for a lot of Catholic families, that was a disappointment because uh, uh, they didn't have that, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, feeling that, you know, when their kids were, when their kids, if they're good enough or they were going to have a chance to play hockey, they weren't going to be in an environment that St. Michael's offered. Hmm. I want to take you back to a night in 1956 I think you're 16 years old. It's December 20th, and you score seven goals in one game. Do you remember much about that night? Yes, I do. I, the goaltender told me to, uh, he said, if you could backhand the puck, you'd have had three more. <laughs> <laughs> what went right that night for you, besides everything? Oh, it was... Uh... It was it was a magical night, you know. We we played really well, and uh, I was fortunate that uh, I was in the right place at the right time. That sounds like typical Dave Key on modesty, if I may say. Something else must have been going well besides just being in the right place at the right time. Yes. Uh, well, I was playing with good hockey players. <laughs> there you go. Uh, in the 1959-60 season, you were the OHA's number one all-star center. In goal was Roger Crozier. Dale Rolfe from the Berry Flyers was on defense, as was Pat Stapleton from the St. Catharines Teepees. You were the centerman from the Majors. Chico Mackey from St. Catharines as well was on the right side, and Pierre Gagné and Vic Hadfield uh, jointly were on the left side. Uh, I wonder, what's it like to play in the NHL with and against those guys that you've played with basically from your early teenage years? Well, you're awful familiar with them. Uh, <laughs> you know, back then when you played, uh, there was only six teams in the NHL, so you played 14 times a year. And uh, you became very familiar with them. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, we were playing junior, and we, we played against each other from the time we were seven, 16, 17, all the way through our pro careers. And, uh, you know, I played against Stan Nikita. Uh, I played against Vic Hatfield, played against Pat Stapleton. I played against Wayne Connolly. Uh, there's Sandy McGregor and uh, Stan and myself. Um, so you learned, you know, the, what you're trying to do, what everybody's trying to do is get better and hopefully have a chance to, to make it to the NHL. And uh, fortunately, that happened for me. Did you play against any of your former St. Mike's teammates in the NHL? I uh, believe I did. I'm trying to remember now who. Uh, yes. Uh, no, Rod Sealing was after me and Arnie Brown was. Arnie Brown was at training camp and Rod Sealing were at training camp, I think. And, I, you know, we played again, played there against them. But I don't. Yeah, I played against Jerry Cheevers. He was a teammate in Junior B and Junior A. He was in Boston. We may hear from Jerry on the Zoom feed after this is all over and done with. Yeah. And uh, I will be interested in plucking some stories out of the two of you during that time. 
I want to ask you about a man who played uh, goal for the Montreal Canadiens back in the 1930s. His name is Wilf Kude. What was his significance? Kude. Kude, yes. What was his uh, significance in your life? Well, uh, he, when I was starting out playing as a as a bantam midget he was the guy who brought minor hockey to Naranda, Ruan Naranda especially Naranda uh, and the mine had brought him in to set up a hockey program for the kids there and um, he at that time was scouting for uh, Detroit Red Wings and I found out later that um, I saw a list, a, a 1952 list, where I was on some list that the Red Wings had that uh, protected my rights uh, as long as I played. But I, when I was 15, I went from midget to juvenile, and I, I still had a year of midget, so I could go with uh, whichever team I uh, chose. And uh, I went to play for Naranda Lions. And um, he was the coach of the... Uh, the D Detroit had two teams. They had a midget team, which I played on, and they had a juvenile team, which I played on. But I left there and um, went to play for the Naranda Lions, where Vince Thompson, who was the coach... Uh, was a scout for Toronto. But Wilf was um, really the first guy who organized minor hockey in uh, in, in Naranda, especially. Uh, he, he had coached the Junior Canadians and uh, the mine, they went up and they hired him, brought him to Naranda, and uh, he was charged with setting up a minor hockey program. I'm going to ask our friend Glenn in Seattle, Washington, to roll a clip. And this is from very, very long ago. Glenn, it's all yours, please. Hamlet saw something in this kid. He saw a nugget. And uh, he gave this boy the ice time and told Davey, now you're going to make mistakes, uh, but you're my boy sort of thing. But he says, you got to check. And today, Davey is one of the best four checkers in the league. My father and Bob Golden were the biggest single factors in changing me. Possibly it uh, didn't show then because it, it took a little while. But then when I came to Toronto, uh, as he said, I uh, Punch gave me the chance to play. He gave me the opportunity and I killed penalties and uh, got an awful lot of ice time and uh, consequently I was able to develop uh, a little more qu uh, quicker than I, than I otherwise would have. That was Wilf Cute at first, and then you, of course, with Ward Cordell on Hockey Night in Canada. What goes through your mind, David Keon, when you see that old footage? That's a long time ago. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> it was nice to see Wilf. <laughs> uh, yes, they were talking about uh, what Father was trying to impart to me about uh, how I was going to be a better player. And um, it took um, it took a while for the uh, process to sink in. And uh, Terry Terry O'Malley can can vouch to our uh, father and I discussing uh, what he wanted me to do or what I what he want what he thought I should do and what I thought I should do. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, he won out. <laughs> well, I think the knock on you was that you were a terrific goal scorer, but you weren't that interested in checking or taking care of your end of the rink. Was that accurate? Yes, it was. You could say that. <laughs> I want to ask about another man who was influential in your life back then, Bob Goldham. He was your coach, yes? Yes, Bob Goldham was our, our coach for my three years in junior. Um, he encouraged me, gave me ice time, and... Uh, uh, was always very supportive, and uh, I really appreciated that. Uh, he, more than anything, talked about, uh, you know, what it was like being a, a professional athlete. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing I learned from him, uh, other than the fact that he, you know, he gave me lots of ice time. I want to ask you about something that appeared to really change in your game. 
I take you back to 1957-58. You had 28 penalty minutes in just 45 games. But after the next two seasons, or in the next two seasons, I should say, you had none, none at all. And of course, for most of your NHL career, you barely cracked double digits when it came to penalty minutes over an 80-game season. What happened in 1958-59 that made you change from a guy who got a penalty every other game to a guy who almost never got penalized at all? Oh, then I don't know what it was. Uh, I think um, I, I, that I can't answer. But after I learned uh, the fundamentals of how to play without the puck, it was uh, – you just didn't put yourself in position where, you know, you'd take penalties. So – it was all facing the person and uh, trying to angle him off. And I uh, was fortunate that I uh, was fairly successful at it. Hmm. David, you never won a Memorial Cup, though, with uh, St. Michael's, did you? No. The year they got rid of me, they won a Memorial Cup the next year. <laughs> Does that bother you? Uh, I would have liked to have had the opportunity. I, I, we would have liked that. We got beat in the in the eighth game in 1959, and I think we got by Peterborough, who went to the Memorial Cup and lost. And then we got beat by uh, St. Catharines in the sixth game in uh, 1960, and they went and they won the Memorial Cup. So it would have been nice um, to have done it. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, we couldn't seem to you know, get the job done. They did the next year though. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was a feather in their cap. I think some of the guys are going to be with us later in this broadcast and will tell us all about that. And Jerry Cheevers may want some bragging rights on that as well. Cause he was part I'm, of that too. I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. <laughs> some, something that may, many people may not know is that of course there were two great junior teams in Toronto at the time. There were you guys at St. Mike's, but the Toronto Marlboros were there as well. What was the rivalry like between your two teams? Oh, uh, very, very intense. Very, very intense. The Marlies and St. Mike's was always, uh, that was um, pretty intense. And, and uh, all the time you had to be careful because something was going to happen. And uh, I, you know, I, everybody, I think everybody who you're going to have today will remember uh, the double headers on Sunday afternoon at the gardens. That was the big thing. Uh, you know, we'd, uh, the first game would be at one o'clock. You'd play two straight time periods and then uh, one stop time. And then we'd either start the first one and then the Marlies would play the second. We'd alternate every weekend. So that was uh, really uh a big thing and and to play at the gardens was uh i remember the first time i went in there it was uh i had my mouth open i was looking up at the at the grace <laughs> i couldn't believe how big the place was yeah i have heard stories that when even when marley players and saint mike's players both ended up playing for the toronto maple leafs there were still tensions and rivalries even though you were teammates in that dressing room is that true yes Yes, there were Marlies Dick, and St. Mike's. Yeah, sure. Dick Duff and Bob Bond used to pick on each other during practice, for example. Well, that's uh, that's not far fetched. <laughs> I want to remind you of another memory and then get you once again to confirm or deny. You're at George's Spaghetti House in Toronto. You see the shaker on the table. It's actually filled with red hot peppers. But Cesar Maniego, who's your St. Mike's goalie and future NHL, of course, tells you that it's really just crushed peanuts. And so you pour them all over your ice cream, take a big bite, and suddenly your mouth is on fire. Confirm or deny, Dave Keon. Well, that's the story. That, that, that happened, but it wasn't at George's. It was at, I think, uh, it was in 1956 or 57 when Caesar came down. I think it was 57. And we were, there was a little uh, place called Mario's. I think they had a couple of, of restaurants. And we were there and we were having pasta. And uh, I asked what this was. Caesar said, oh, you got to put that on your, uh, your pasta. It's really good. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and my mouth was burning for about three days. <laughs> Did you ever get even with him? No, I, oh, I don't think so. No. Speaking of that, Caesar's another guy that I played against. He played in uh, Montreal, and then he played in uh, Minnesota, Minnesota and New York. Yep. Yeah. Cesare Maniago. He's like, he seems really like with all the goaltenders. Yeah. We've got some wonderful footage as well of a 1961 exhibition game that was played uh, between the St. Mike's Old Boys and the current Majors team. And believe it or not, Rocket Richard was the referee of this game. King Clancy was the linesman in this game. There were old boys currently playing for the Maple Leafs, like Dick Duff and Tim Horton and Red Kelly and Frank Mahovlich, who apparently played in that game. But again, the story I heard was that Punch Imlac, there's King and Rocket. The story I heard was that Punch Imlac threatened you with a $150 fine if you played, so you didn't. Is that true? No, that's not true. I was hurt at the time. And, ah. uh, and I didn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't play. So, but I was there. As Eddie Chadwick. How was it? It was fine. I, w I wished I would have been able to play, but uh, I did not. Hmm. How much of playing for St. Mike's do you think turned you into the excellent National Hockey League player you turned out to become? Oh, it certainly helped me. I mean, uh, the discipline that, that, that you need to play the game and, uh, you know, learning the skills that, you, that you're going to need to, uh, to be successful. Uh, those all happened when I was playing junior at St. Michael's. And then um, finally learning what Father Bauer was trying to teach me that it was how important it was to play without the puck when I when I realized that you know his saying was unless you can score three goals a game uh, you're going to have to learn to play without the puck or learn to check and uh, and he had um, a theory of how it was done and uh, he tried to he he taught me that and uh, it it was uh, certainly a big part of my help help me and become a big, big part of my career. Hmm. You played professional hockey till you were, what, 41, 42? 42. 42. Did you ever have a fight? Uh, yes, I did. I had a fight with Greg Shepard. It didn't last very long. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, with, with Greg Shepard. But I want to, I, I want to, uh, point out one thing that fought that I don't think many people have touched on it about father is he thought uh, how important it was for players to protect themselves. And uh, he told, you know, he, he taught us uh, things that um, you really wouldn't think about. And you incorporated those things into your game to protect yourself. How you went into the corner on an angle. When you went along the boards, you put your hand up to protect your head. Um, little subtle things that you, if they weren't pointed, some players uh, did them naturally. And some players, uh, it was something that they had to learn. And some of those things were things that I had to learn. And I... Um, uh, I think that they re they really helped me in my career. If a fight broke out in a St. Mike's game that Father David Bauer was coaching, what did he think about it? Well, he didn't coach me, but he he, he was the general manager when I was playing junior, and uh, he was uh, less than thrilled. He tried to dissuade, I guess, players from doing it? Yes, he did. He did. But there was there was one um, we were playing the Marlies at Ravina Gardens and uh, Dave Chambers was playing for us. And he and Roger Cote got into a scrum. And uh, I don't think he said anything to Dave because uh, Dave was he took care of Roger Cote. Roger Cote was kind of a, a little bit of a bully. And uh, Dave Chambers took care of him. So that kind of quieted everything down between, uh, you know, that was a, a Marley St. Mike's thing. <laughs> 
Dave Keanu, I want to ask you one last question. Uh, it was only a little over a week ago that you turned, and I can't believe this because you look fantastic, 81 Thanks. years old. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You look great. Thank what you. What occupies your time these days? Well, uh, I, I have a very, uh, my wife bought me a very good bicycle, so I, I ride uh, six days a week, and I try to do some stretching and uh, stay in shape. You look in shape. <laughs> and can I tell you this as well? I happened to be talking to Ken Dryden earlier today on another matter. And I asked him, who's the greatest leaf of all time? And he didn't pause a second before he said, Dave Keon. Well, so there. Thank you. That's very nice. Uh, we would love it if you'd stand by and enjoy however much of the rest of the show that you can, and then maybe even see you in the Zoom party afterwards. All right, Steve. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this. I'm so glad. It was a joy to talk to you. Thank you. Dave Keon, greatest leaf ever. But not the oldest person on tonight's program. I think that's coming up right now. We would like to introduce you, coming to us now live from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a gentleman by the name of Ed Sanford. Ed Sanford spent four years at St. Mike's from 1944 to 47. He was a Memorial Cup champion in 1947. He got 67 points in 27 games that year. He was the most valuable player in the league. And he's only 92 years young right now. Ed Sanford, can we have him join us tonight? There he is right there. Mr. Sanford, how are you this evening? Steve, I'm fine at the moment. Uh, I'm very pleased to be asked to get on your show. We're delighted to have you here. Tell us how you ended up at St. Mike's in the first place. Well, I, I was at St. Leo's in Mimico going, and uh, my dad wanted me to go to uh, De La Salle, but uh, my close cousin, Eddie, Eddie Harrison, had gone to St. Mike's the year ahead of me, and uh, he was uh, recommended me to go to St. Mike's for the hockey. Good advice? Oh, it was good. Yeah, there was, <laughs> there was organized games there and organized teams, and, and we played. Uh, we did well over the years. You sure did. How, mm -hmm. let's, uh, take us back to that 1947 season where everything seemed to go so well. What, what stands out most in your mind about that year? Practice. <laughs> we practiced against Benny White and Harry Succo and Rudy Mige and Ray Hannigan. And we had more battles in practice than we ever had in the whole season. Uh, our practices were really tough practices, uh, but they set them up for a, a long run at the Memorial Cup. You had a fairly legendary guy as your head coach, didn't you? Joe Primo. Yeah, Joe was, uh, Joe was a great coach, and he knew how to – how to handle kids, and he, he got a lot out of us. Uh, a, uh, we all admired him, and anything Joe asked us to do, we tried to do. His nickname, of course, was Gentleman Joe Primo. Did that make sense to you? Well, uh, I know that that he was a smooth hockey player, and he had he uh, forward uh, played center on a great uh, team that the, the Maple Leafs had, and uh, with two with uh, left uh, big. Charlie Conniger on one, one side and, and I think Busher Jackson on the other. So yes, uh, indeed. Great team. Hmm. I, I'm uh, there. Uh, Con Smythe right there on the, uh, on the left with a, with a Stanley cup that looked a little different back in those days. I'm always interested in, in how you and, and how players who went through St. Mike's, how they felt that it influenced them to become the NHL players they did become. And we'll talk a bit about your NHL career in a second, but how instrumental do you think St. Mike's was in your NHL career? Well, I think it was very uh, instrumental in, in getting us to be where we should be. Uh, go to school, do what you have to do, uh, go play hockey, practice hard, play hard. And uh, those were the things that they led us to try to do. Now, Dave Keon just told us he didn't get into any fights. How about you? Oh, I don't remember fights. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have if I, uh, I must have got beat when I did fight. <laughs> <laughs> now, interestingly enough, the Boston Bruins were the team that made you an offer to play in the National Hockey League. Would you have preferred to play for the Maple Leafs, your hometown team? No, really that. I just, gosh, I wanted to go to college. I wanted to go to St. Michael's College after I graduated from high school. And uh, 
but the Bruins came along and offered me a job. The, the war was just over. My dad was saying that things will be quiet. And if you have a, a hockey job, uh, why don't you give it a try? And then if it doesn't uh, pan out, you can come back home, go back to school if you want. Hmm. What did you love most about playing for St. Mike's? Oh, I, I had seen the junior team play. My dad had taken me to games back in the 30s. Uh, so we kind of got a, a like for their, their double loose feathers. And uh, it was always a great school. Uh, everybody talked about it. So I was very happy to be a student and, and, and to be there at, at that school. Hmm. You had a very nice career in the National Hockey League. How did you enjoy that? Well, no, my career was nothing at, at all. It, it, uh, we had a problems, a few problems. <laughs> we just got started when they, I cut my Achilles tendon and lost a year and a half, and it took quite a while to get back. But then uh, uh, we did finally get back playing uh, a, a lot better than we had been. So uh, we finished uh, out in Detroit. But, uh, no, my, my life was, uh, was a happy life there. But I think you had, what, eight seasons in the NHL? Nine seasons. Nine seasons. Okay, that's nine more than I had. So you can't tell me that you didn't have a good go of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, was traded to Detroit, and for a while I was going to play with Howe and Lindsay. Uh, but then I hear, again, I got hurt. I uh, got my knee banged up, and I had to wear a brace. And uh, uh, Jack Adams, the, uh, the owner, didn't like that very much, and he thought I should be shipped out to Chicago, which he did do very shortly after I got rehabbed. Hmm. What was it like to play in the old Boston Garden? Oh, it was a great place. I, I, I had not even seen the garden when I played my first game there. And uh, the first night I, we got in it and played, the ice was about a quarter of an inch thick, and we were going through right to the concrete. And uh, more, most of us had our skates uh, to be re-sharpened. So my, my uh, uh, introduction to the, maple, the old garden was not a, a very good one, but it, it, uh, over the years, you got used to what you had. Mm -hmm. Who were your best buddies on those old Boston Bruins teams? Uh, my best buddy was Fleming McKell, the fellow I played with at St. Mike's, uh, uh, Red, uh, Red, Red Hat Kelly, who I played with at uh, St. Mike's. Uh, you know, we never got to play together as as, as pros, but uh, uh, Ray Hannigan, who went to St. Mike's and later became a priest, was another one of our good buddies, and uh, I was friends with those boys for most of my life. Hmm. Now, one of the things that was so interesting about your career is that after it was over on the ice, I gather Milt Schmidt gave you a call and said, come on back. We think we got something that might be of interest to you. Tell us about that. Well, that was an interesting thing. I had uh, got out of uh, hockey, and I was working for an investment firm in another business that I enjoyed very much. And Milt uh, had an opening for uh, uh, a, a timekeeper and uh, asked if that would be of interest to me. And I, I talked to my wife about it, and, and she said, whatever you like. So uh, I said, I think I'll, I'll do it. It gets me back into hockey. I love to watch them. And it so happened to be that Bobby Orr was coming up that year, and and you can see what Bobby did for hockey in in, in Boston. Uh, so I was with him when he, that happened, and I had about thirty years in there, and that, which I enjoyed very much. You did that for thirty years. I did as a part time job. Yes, <laughs> terrific. Didn't one of your one of your kids do it as well with you? Now uh, my youngest or my uh, oldest boy uh, played college hockey and, and played a little semi-pro and then got into a business. And uh, so when he was uh, working, uh, I, I got him to come and give me a hand and I showed him what he had to do for the job. And, and so when he got uh, strong enough that he, and knew what he wanted to do, I thought I'd ret retire, which I did do, and he took over. Hmm. You obviously saw a lot of tremendous hockey players come through the Boston Garden over those years. Who's the best player you ever saw? Well, everybody said Bobby Orr, and I, I think they're right. Uh, Bobby had terrific ability to change speed, and to he seemed to know where everybody uh, was on the ice. I don't know how we saw them, but he, he, was, he was in the class by himself without any doubt. Hmm. Mr. Sanford, i got to ask you one more question, which is, at 92 years old, you seem in phenomenal shape for a man of your age. How are you doing it? 
I don't think I am in great shape, <laughs> but I, uh, no, I, I, I think one of the things I took care of myself pretty well, both on and off hockey. And, uh, uh I, I just, uh, follow a routine, take, uh, you know, if it's good for you, take it. If it isn't, don't, don't touch it. And I've been very lucky. God has taken care of me. That's a wonderful thing. We're yeah. delighted that you could spend so much time with us tonight, and we hope you'll hang around for whatever the rest of the program you can for. Steve, my uh, sincere thanks to you for the invitation. Not at all. The great Ed Sanford from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Well, the beat goes on now as we continue this nostalgic night of St. Michael's hockey history, and we want to now celebrate something, the 60th anniversary of which is taking place not that long from now, May the 5th. Less than five weeks from now, it'll be 60 years to the day since St. Mike's won its last Memorial Cup. And there's the team, and look how jubilant they are. It was a six-game series, a victory over the Edmonton Oil Kings, and the games weren't here, as had been the custom. This series took place out in Western Canada. So it was a long, a long haul uh, for the folks to get out there and get the job done, but that they did. And we have four members of that championship team who are with us right now, so let's introduce... Dave Draper, Barry McKenzie, Terry O'Malley, and Andre Champagne. Dave Draper, four seasons at St. Mike's. He comes to us tonight from Burlington. Barry McKenzie, two seasons with the Majors. He's on Manitoulin Island right now, God's country to be sure. Terry O'Malley, four seasons with the Majors. He joins us from Saskatchewan this evening. And Andre Champagne, three seasons with the Majors, and he's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Gentlemen, hoping you're hearing me okay. How are we doing? Wonderful. Excellent. Very good. Excellent. Okay, let's go through this. Dave Draper, you're born in Ottawa, so how did you end up making it to Toronto and St. Mike's? Your dad. Our, our dad um, was in Ottawa, and uh, Bruce and I, Michael, Pat, uh, we, we were in Ottawa. Bruce, of course, your, uh, was he your twin brother? Yes, who I guess I should say, just for those who don't know, tragically died of leukemia at only age 27. So did not have the hockey career he deserved, did he? No, and he was a good one. Hmm. All right, let me find out from Andre. You're from Eastview, which is near Kingston. How did you come to St. Mike's? Where's Andre? Did we lose the line to Tulsa? Okay, well, let's see if we can get that back. In the meantime, we'll go to Barry and Terry, both of whom are from Toronto, I think. So your path was a shorter one. Terry, how, tell us how you got to St. Mike's. Well, I think I, I, I owe a little bit to the Drapers. We, uh, uh, Bruce and Dave went to the same grade school I did called St. Monica's. And before that, I'd gone to St. Michael's Choir School. My mother wanted me to be a choir boy. The four <laughs> lads were there. But... Uh, I didn't want to be it. I wanted to play hockey, and I started to hang out with these guys and another fellow named Roger Nielsen, and they were going to St. Mike's, so I whined to my mother that I wanted to go to St. Mike's where the Drapers went. And uh, she said, well, you want to go? You had to line up. So we went down, and we lined up with about 500 other kids. I get just before the door, and this guy in a black sedan comes out, big, burly guy, and he says, we're not taking any more applications. Well, the guy I went with, he says, we didn't line up all this time just to get turned away. So we snuck in the basement <laughs> and, and came up through the door. And I handed in my uh, application. How would you get in here? The guy was there, the same guy. I said, oh, we just got lost. So he took our application, and I was accepted. And the strange thing was my first coach was Father David Bauer. So hmm. it moved from there. It moved from there. Barry McKenzie, how about you? How did you make it to St. Mike's? Well, when I was 14, I had tuberculosis. And I spent nine months and one day in the sanitarium and was told I could never play hockey again. And about a year and a half after that, I, I they let me back on the ice. And I played for the Weston Dukes Junior B team. And somehow, Father Dave must have heard that I was somehow of a not a bad hockey player. And I got a call in the mid middle of the summer of 60 saying, uh, would you be interested in going to Notre Dame? I mean, to St. Mike's. And I, and I thought, St. Mike's is school 
my option was Marley's with Turk Broda, and I kind of thought Turk Broda might have might have made me into a bit of a goon. Oh, and O'Malley says I always was a goon anyway. <laughs> but but I I I, I met uh, Father Dave, and I was so impressed, and uh, and. Uh, in the summer of 60, uh, yeah, that's how I got there. I mean, the best thing that ever happened to me. Okay. I just want to let everybody know we're still trying to work out getting Andre Champagne back from Tulsa, Oklahoma. But uh, as anybody who knows what the past year has been like, uh, this pandemic has been very strange on bandwidth and Zoom calls. And everybody knows what it's like to lose, you know, lose somebody halfway through a Zoom call or a Skype feed. So we'll work on that and try and get Andre back. In the meantime, I want to find out more about this championship season that you guys enjoyed 60 years ago next month. Dave Draper, you guys went out to Alberta to fight for the Memorial Cup. What stands out now all these years later about that contest? There's you guys arriving. There's the plane. Yes. <laughs> Answer. Huh? Answer's question. Dave, what do you remember about this trip? Uh, yes, uh, we went. We went to uh, <coughs> um, let me see. Well, it wasn't called Pearson Airport back then. We called it Malton. I remember. Yes, I had to go to, to Malton to fly out. Yes. We got out there and uh, we, th we thought we would have a good chance uh, to get the cup. And I thought, I, th I think uh, for sure, um, the Father, Father Product, Father Bauer. There's Cheevers. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, he is one of the best uh, hockey, pro hockey, coffee, uh, hockey. Uh, coach, and uh, we will, we went uh, uh, to win, and uh, we we did win for the uh, for the. Uh, um, so yeah. it, it was it was wonderful. You guys took it in six games, Ter Terry O'Malley. How dirty a series was it? You know it uh, it was it wasn't that dirty. They had a uh, hex dial in net. And they had a Ken Stevenson, who was a pretty rugged guy that he picked up from Brandon. But, uh, you know, it was a big wide rink. I remember the net, you had about three feet behind the net. We had to figure out how to uh, stand behind the net a little closer to the net. But we won the first three games. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then after we won that, we lost the next two games. I always remember listening to Father Bauer talk about his strategy on that afterwards. <laughs> And he came in after the after the uh, second game, we'd lost. So now the, the series is three and two, uh, we're leading. And he says to the, the reporters, "Say, well, how do you feel now that uh, you're down two? What are you going to do about it?" And he said, "Well, I wanted to give our players confidence." He said. So I told him, "Well, I really am worried." He said, "He's worried about the Berlin Wall that's going up. He's worried about the Cuban crisis." <laughs> I don't remember him saying that. It really affecting us. But what he did, he moved us out of our apartment, our hotel, into the famous McDonald Hotel. And then the, the day before the final game, we were all out for a picnic. And we ended up playing baseball and swimming. And then came back and played a pretty steady game and won the last uh, game 4-2. So we got on, Andre Champagne 30. back now from... Tulsa, Oklahoma. So let's ask Andre. That was considered Andre one of the uh, one of the really smart moves that Father made. Namely, rather than practice you guys a whole lot after the second loss, he just got you away from there. Got you away and did complete non hockey stuff. Do you remember that, Andre? Have we got you back? Okay, let, let, while we're still trying to reestablish contact with Andre, let's go to Barry McKenzie. Barry, can you tell us about that, about how Father Bauer just got you away from hockey and to clear your minds, as it were? Well, I think that he, Father Dave was always kind of more into your mind than anything else, and he knew how to motivate us. 
and so uh, to me, it was a uh, the biggest thing was that we just were getting away, and you know, hockey is not the end of the world, you know, and so let's uh, let's enjoy life, and then uh, we can get back to working our our butts off, and uh, and competing the way we can, and so uh, he was just a great motivator. And uh, there's no doubt he was the most influential person in my mind. And uh, I, I think he just, he, he, knew, he knew how to make us work. Hmm. Andre, I think we've got you back now. Tell Not us all. how nervous you were about losing the two games in a row and whether you feared that you might not be able to win the fourth game. I felt pretty confident. We're a pretty good team. We're a good defensive team also. So there's a letdown, I guess. But I felt confident. I really did. And who were your best buddies on that team, Andre? Well, Conlon was good. And uh, Dave, Court, all the boys. All the boys. This is some great old footage that we're looking at there. Dave Draper, who were your best buddies on the team? <coughs> Let me uh, see here. <laughs> Uh, There's a bunch of them there. Yes, um, Andre, Andre, Paul, Colin, uh, for sure. Heenan, of course, he was on our uh, with Bruce and I, and um, I would say uh, for sure that uh, uh, Bruce Draper. Right on, Terry. How about you? Well, you know, we when I went to St. Mike's, I went there because of the Drapers, really. And uh, we played Bantam, Midget, Junior B, and Junior A together. And we won the championship at, at every level. And Father Bauer was our coach except for the Junior B League. But the guy I hung out a lot with was with Paul Jackson. I knew him very well. He's deceased now. And, of course, I knew the Drapers quite well as uh, in, in the team because we were local to the uh, we came from the city and we lived at home we didn't live in the dormitories like other players so I was very close to them um, so they were my they were, they were good buddies Barry McKenzie of course became a fine buddy uh, now we've been together we played junior together college together internationally together so I'd have to say Barry is uh, he's become a fine buddy <laughs> that's nice I'm going to ask Glenn again uh, out in Seattle, Washington, to roll some footage, uh, if he's got it standing by, of the parade that you guys got after you won. And this is really something. Again, people, if you didn't live in Toronto back in the day, we're talking 60 years ago now, yes, when a junior hockey team won the Memorial Cup, there was a big parade downtown. There's Old City Hall. There's the Cenotaph, a marching band. Uh, 10,000 people came out to welcome you guys back. There's the Memorial Cup. Um, okay, Barry, pick up the story. What do you remember of this day? No, just everything was uh, wonderful. We had uh, we uh, kind of climbed the uh, summit and uh, and uh, had done done uh, so well that uh, it was just another way of. And I, I'm I'm a little bit dismayed that. I had my uh, hat. We we all got uh, those you got Stetson cowboy hats. hats. Yeah, and I had them. And I and I I came to my camp today from Sudbury, and I forgot my damn hat because I wanted to have it on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> now that guy it, on the left of that shot there was Nathan Phillips. He's the man they named the square after. He was the mayor of Toronto had, back then. The hat had Saint Mike's sixty sixty one, and so. Uh, Anyway, it was a great feeling. It was the great. We had a great group of guys, and uh, it was just a wonderful feeling, you know. There's Nate Phillips. Now that's Jim Gregory, I guess, isn't it? There, getting the key to the city, maybe something like that. Yep. Andre Champagne, what do you remember about this day? It was a great day, great honor. Go back so many years, you kind of forget somewhat. But not the parade itself. You know, that was good. Was really good. Terry, how about you? Yeah, I, I remember uh, uh, the crowds going down in the car wearing our big 10-gallon uh, hats and giving uh, the speeches that were made. You know, it was really kind of surreal because we're just young 
19, 20 year olds. <laughs> and, and all this is happening because we won a hockey uh, championship. So it was really kind of fun and, and uh, exciting, yes. You know, a funny thing about it all is that I, I'm not sure what game it was, but uh, Sonny Osborne from, from Weston, he uh, was staying uh, at the U of T to do his exams. And he, he came out for game, uh, I think, game six, I think it was. or And they didn't know what happened, but he got three goals. <laughs> and it was just, uh, again, like Father Bauer's commitment to education and, and hockey. And so uh, that was kind of an interesting thing. I, I'm not sure which game that was, Mo, but. That know, was the third game. Third game, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and also, we, what you don't know about that, we had Jerry Cheers and Net, who was absolutely outstanding. But we also had another NHL goalie that only played uh, 10 games in the season. And that was uh, Dave Dryden. And Dave Dryden was writing exams too. And, and he had to leave early before, because he had to go back and write exams. He had to leave early before the game was over. He was our backup goalie. And he left about with uh, 10 minutes left in the game. And we were up uh, four to one. And, uh, and so that was... Uh, uh, it's interesting to know that we had that other goalie with the team as well. You know, there's a funny story about that game. Um, you know, we won the first two and lost the next two. There was people beside us that had had uh, season's tickets, and they were moved out. I forget what the manager's name was, Lalonde or something. In any case, he, he put two uh, young ladies in there, <laughs> rather scantily dressed with see-through uh, uh, ribbons and you know see through sweaters on, and I I came off the bench in the third period and I was sitting on the went up to talk with uh, Brian Walsh, who was there was a tiered kind of uh, platform our our bench, and Brian Walsh gives me the elbow. Did you see that over there? And there was Jim Gregory. He was spread eagle, <laughs> as he trying to block out these two women from distracting the players and father Bauer had to move down to the other end of the bench. And I said to myself, I missed this whole show. <laughs> yeah. Terry, you, you were watching it all along. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> you, no, no, you were there watching it. That's uh, why you couldn't, that's why you couldn't uh, finish your checks. <laughs> <laughs> nice guy. He's my buddy. <laughs> now, now, Barry and Terry, you, you both had, I think a, like a, a such a good relationship with David Bauer that you followed him out to the University of British Columbia to play for the Thunderbirds there, did you not? We yeah. Did. yeah. He, after uh, the, the thing at St. Mike's, he had this uh, dream of the national team, and and it was uh, it was a no-brainer to follow uh, to follow Father Dave. It was a no-brainer, and. Uh, yeah, it, it, and like, as I said, it's one of the most rewarding things that ever happened. Uh, UBC and then the national team, and and uh, as I said, he's a, he was a a very influential man in my life, and uh, and uh, and uh, I'm 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 glad that I followed that trail. <laughs> yeah, he he uh, when Father Bauer died, he was buried in Kitchener Waterloo, and Diane was there, and and we were all there at his funeral. Up and when he was being buried, and finally he was uh, he was uh, buried. And Diane says to Barry, she says, "Now what are you two going to do?" <laughs> you know, because we played all our, our hockey with him, and then we we played college hockey and international hockey. Actually, he got us to go to Japan, and we had a career in Japan for about seven years. And then he he convinced us to go to Wilco. Which is the Notre Dame College, and we we had a twenty five year career there. So, so Diane rightfully asked, "What are you going to do now <laughs> that Father Bauer's gone?" Well, Terry, while you've got the floor, I should also ask you about the three Olympic games that you played in, including in nineteen eighty when you were forty years old. Tell us about that. Yeah, <laughs> that was a uh, you know I I had I'd come back from Japan, and we worked hard in Japan. We were fit. But I hadn't played in about a year and a half, and and uh, a fellow named Reinhardt turned professional, and another guy, guy named Joe Grant, who who uh, played with the team, he uh, broke his jaw. So Father phones me up. He says, uh, "We'd like you to come back out and try." I said, "Father, I I, I 
I haven't played in a year and a half. These are pretty good players, you know. And, and he said, you'll do okay. And so I tell my wife that, uh, you know, I was teaching at the time. You have to go out to Calgary. I have to go back to Calgary and, and get in shape to play for the Olympics. And I said, Father Bauer thinks they need some experience. And she said to me, experience? <laughs> Does he need a relic? <laughs> so anyways, I went back out and I trained and I, I made the team and uh, I actually had a pretty good tournament <laughs> all in all. So excellent. Yeah, so that was my third Olympics. And we played in 64 and 68 and, and uh, he, uh, we had some, we had disappointments there in 64. Actually where three of us were tied for second and because they changed the goals and uh, for and against, we ended up out of the medals. We actually won the world championship that year. But we lost the Olympics uh, because they were they were combined. And in the '68, we won a bronze, and, and in uh, 1980, we uh, we lost out in the uh, we lost out to Finland when they scored a goal from the far blue line. So hmm. that was a that was a real disappointment because we played the Americans seven ten seven times that year, and we'd won three and lost three and tied one. We were both the kind of the same kind of teams, uh, uh, college teams. So we, we didn't get to meet them there. So it was a, you know, it, it was a different path than professional. Right. I want to ask Dave Draper about something. There's no way he's going to remember, but I remember it. Dave Draper, the last time I saw you was, I think, in 1979 in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. You were a guest speaker at the Benebra Sports Dinner because you were, I think, the general manager of the Junior A Hamilton Fin Cups, which won the Memorial Cup. Have I got that right? Yes, you do. Who was the big star on that team? The big star on that team, my goodness. Let me see here. I, don't I remember. He was the number one draft choice in the NHL. I think Dale McCourt was the guy I'm talking about. Exactly. From, Thank you. from, from Sudbury. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he was, he was wonderful. Really, and then we had a good a good team uh, there. You got McCourt was a was a finesse player and had great talent, but you had some guys who were tough as hell on that team too, if I recall. I mean, it was a team from Hamilton after all; it had to be tough. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. I'm going to give you some. You've got some of the programs there in front of you, I guess. I hope. I'm thinking, was Al Secord on that team? Yes, he was. I'm thinking he might have been. Yeah, yep. he, he might have been one of the best for sure. Really. Yep, for sure. Andre Champagne, I want to ask you about the fact that you played two games in the National Hockey League for the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1962 and 63. What do you remember about those games? I was unbelievable. You know, a little nervous, of course. Never played up there. I'm mostly a defensive hockey player, but uh, it was pretty good. I enjoyed it, and uh, I wish I could do it again. <laughs> How was it that you cracked the lineup? Was somebody injured that you were replacing? Frank Mohavlich. Mohavlich got hurt. In the, in the you filled in for the big the M. Up. Right. And if I remember right, Glenn, I don't know if we've got this footage standing by, but I think we've got some vis of you playing. Didn't you wear number 18? Correct. And why did, did they give you 18, or did you get to pick it, or what? No, I just they just gave me a jersey. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and now you can say you played in the National Hockey League. Yes. But I'll tell you what, in, kept, that, in that 61 season, the 61 series in Edmonton, Andre got a lot of big goals for us. Remember that, Frenchman? <laughs> oh, yes. Barry, is that what you guys called him back then, goals. Frenchman? Uh, uh, among other things. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you guys about the fact that yours was truly the last great St. Mike's team because I think essentially they decided after that Memorial Cup victory that the season had become so involved and there were so many games 
and I, I guess some of the uh, priests at the school believed that it was affecting the ability of the students to get a good academic education. And St. Mike's hockey program essentially left Major Junior after that. And uh, I don't know, Barry, why don't you start on this? What did you think of that decision to drop out of Major Junior hockey? Well, I think we were all kind of floored by it, but uh, that, that's when they, they, they made the uh, Metro Toronto Junior Hockey League with, uh, you know, Brampton, uh, Whitby, uh, you know, Stouffville and ourselves, you know. There's about five teams, and so obviously it wasn't uh, that great of uh, a challenge. And we played some games against the uh, the, the teams from the OHL or the, the Quebec Hockey League, but you know it wasn't the greatest thing. But uh, we, we moved on, and uh, yeah, it's uh, one of those things that you know you just have to uh, adjust to. You know, you have to live with. You know. Mm. The school made a decision, and we live with it. Andre, what did you think of the decision to get out of junior hockey after that? I kind of agree with what they said, because I think I don't know why that's the school's decision, but uh, I think it should have kept on. But they did come back, and then it went to, what, Miss Sagwa eventually? Yep. yep. They did. So, But that's the decision they make. You know, we can't do anything about that, so. Could have, could have probably maybe had a chance for another one. Who knows? We had a lot of good guys coming out of the junior B team too, you know. Deneen and what have you. So anyway, that's the way it was. I wish we yeah. kept going, but I end up I end up going Neil McNeil after a year, then I went to Toronto Marlboros by competitors. But it all turned out good, so yeah, we should just is. say for the record that the uh, St. Mike's left the OHA in 1961 and then the Metro Toronto Hockey League right. after 62. And then they were out of it for 35 years. They returned to the OHL in 1997. And then Eugene Melnick bought the team in 2001 and then moved to Mississauga in 2007. Became the Mississauga St. Michael's Majors. Terry, how about you? What was your view of that decision to basically get out of major junior hockey? Yeah, well, I, you know, I knew Father Bauer pretty well, and he, he, he was ambivalent about it. He knew that we that year we played 105 games went right through to May, and we had grade 13 exams at the time, which was tough. Everything when Sputnik went up with Russia, they changed the curriculum in Ontario. You had to do three sciences, two maths, and or, or two. Nine courses, so it was a it was tough to get your grade thirteen, and still play junior hockey. So he was, in one sense, he realized that. In another sense, he felt that that this was a tradition with the school that uh, if they worked that a little better, they could have gotten through it. So I didn't like the decision, but it, it was what it's what what they made at the time. I think they were streaming more academically, and they thought that the hockey was too professional at the time mm -hmm. for a junior and for a high school. Yeah. I think today we'd say it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. That's the expression. Sure. Well, gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for joining our little show here this evening. I want to thank Dave Draper and Barry McKenzie and Terry O'Malley and Andre Champagne for joining us from all over North America. And uh, Barry, I'm going to remind you that before we went on, you yep. offered to invite me to your camp on Manitoulin Island because I got one there too. And uh, provided the premier lets us out of our homes and, and the lockdown ends, I will uh, happily come and hoist a glass with you this summer. Make sure you do, okay? It's uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put your uh, name into my Facebook to, or what? I don't do Facebook, but into my uh, phone. So <laughs> make sure that, you, that I I will I would love to have you come. We will make that happen, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Great to see you all. Dave and Andre, nice to see you. Thank nice you very much. Same. Thank you. Be good. All the best. Thank you, Steve. My pleasure. Well, the nostalgia continues here, and the one name that we have heard more than any other this evening is where we're going to go next, Father David Bauer. He was the guy. He was the heart. He was the soul. He was the brains. He was the guts of St. Michael's Majors Hockey back in the day. And we have somebody here who just happens to share his last name. E.J. Bauer, come on in here and tell us where are we finding you this evening? 
Hey, Steve, good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm up uh, on the West Coast uh, on Lake Huron in Bayfield. Bayfield. Okay, yeah. terrific. Let's start with the obvious. How are you related to Father David Bauer? Uh, he was my uncle. So and, your father uh, was? So my dad was Ray. And uh, so, of course, there were 11 in the family. And uh, they all played. Uh, even the girls. I had aunts that played for U of T in the 40s. So uh, uh, if they weren't playing hockey, they were figure skaters or tennis players. But academics was definitely uh, something that was very much a focus. Hmm. Uh, so Bobby Bauer of the Boston Bruins, the famed Krautline, he was an uncle too then? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Porky and Milt, uh, of course, Kitchener boys. Uh, they all arrived. Bobby arrived first in Boston, but uh, before he went there, I mean, uh, my dad played with all the brothers in, in Waterloo, uh, and Bobby and uh, Frank and Gene, they all played, uh, and they actually won, uh, won cups at St. Mike's, uh, and then uh, Bobby, of course, went on to, uh, to play a, a career in, uh, in Boston. Hmm. Now, Father David Bauer, of course, died way too young. He was only 64 when he was stricken with pancreatic cancer. So can I start with this? How, how well did you actually know him? <laughs> well, I, I saw somewhere today that they were talking about the next lockdown, and they said, it sounds like wait till your father gets home. And uh, Father Dave, basically, uh, he was the lockdown king. So there was my mom wait till your father gets home. And then there was always wait till father Dave gets here. So, uh, and what did that well. mean? <laughs> what, what did it mean when you said, wait till father Dave gets here? Well, he, he had a way to discipline us in a different way than my parents. Um, you know, I have to say like there's 83 first cousins on the Bauer side and, uh, he was actively involved in everybody's life for the most part, as difficult as that would be to balance what he was doing. Uh, but everybody had a personal relationship with him. And uh, I know in our particular family, my dad, Patsy and Ray, uh, he definitely was a, uh, uh, a focus on our education and uh, whether we were playing sports or, uh, or uh, any, any wrong tracks that we might be going down, he would, uh, he would basically straighten it out. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, the journalist in me wants to find out more about that. Like, was he a guy who would spare the rod and spoil the child or quite the opposite? No, I think, well, he, he spent a long time with us. He, there were different times where you would get the quiet shoulder and he would just say enough to have you walk away trying to figure out what he said. And he left enough with you to think about, to, uh, to find your way. Uh, but as, as Barry and, Terry were on and uh, Ricky Noonan and some of them, you know, there, there were some, some late night uh, discussions that uh, would definitely uh, have straightened out anybody that was going down the wrong track. <laughs> okay. Did you have conversations with him about his time at St. Mike's? Uh, to some degree. I mean, uh, not so much as a player. I mean, the story goes, you know, Bobby turned pro and uh, you know, Father Dave was coming up and uh, he was as gifted as his other brothers, but they all admired Bobby. And, uh, you know, you can't win three Lady Bings and scoring title in the NHL with your line mates two years in a row, a couple of cups, and not be influential in, in, in not just your, your circle of friends, but your, your own siblings. So I think they, they admired Bob and, and they followed in his footsteps, but you know, Father Dave was drafted to, uh, and they had an eye on him at 15 and he was a pretty good hockey player. Well, he was and, the captain of the majors, was he not, in the 40s? Yeah, and uh, and Ted Lindsay and he in 43, 44 were brought in as imports in Oshawa uh, late in the playoffs and they were kind of pretty instrumental in winning uh, a Memorial Cup there. Mm -hmm. Now, the story I heard was, and you can obviously... Um, confirm or deny or perhaps uh, amplify on the story was that he got, even though he was an extremely talented hockey player, he got to a point in his life where he saw less relevance in 
playing a game, going to the movies, playing another game, going to the movies, and he heard a higher calling. Is that what happened? Yeah, I, I think, Steve, um, growing up in the Bauer household, I was, I was named after my grandfather, and uh, the focus on education was, was very much uh, uh, number one. Athletics was as well. Uh, my grandfather played in the early 1900s, uh, ball and hockey, and he knew how instrumental it was for developing, you know, disciplined character uh, in, in boys and girls growing up. And he really promoted the balanced education with sport. Uh, and so I think when Father Dave went off to camp, what, what I didn't say earlier was that at 15, he was drafted and, and uh, my grandfather really wasn't impressed that he was heading to Boston. Uh, and so some discussions took place and uh, the agreement was that he would come back. He'd be allowed to go to camp, come back and uh, get his education. He would go to St. Mike's. And I think he came back from camp that year and uh, he had his eyes opened. He was quite young, 15 years old. You know, you can imagine what it's like today. But uh, at 15, um, the lifestyle wasn't quite uh, maybe where, where he thought it was in a sheltered uh, small town of Waterloo. And uh, so he started, he started to have more global, uh, far-reaching things other than just hockey. And uh, I think it was because of his father's influence on his life. And, and uh, uh, that was a big you know, the, the time, certainly the 40s, 50s, the war, uh, all those things had had a major impact, I'm sure. Well, and, he, and of course, he was the, uh, you know, the inspiration behind the Canadian Olympic program as well. Did you guys ever talk about that? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think, uh, again, Bobby coming back out of Boston, coming back, being instrumental in, you know, with the, the Dutchman team, my dad was involved uh with those teams, uh, either funding or GMing them, and and uh, hockey was spoke of quite quite a lot, but education was as well. And I think, uh, you know, through the through the fifties, forties, and fifties, we knew in our family through my parents and uh, extended family, we knew the Bauer family knew that you couldn't send amateurs uh, to play the professionals. And so the thought of a national team, the thought of a, a permanent team, uh, you have to remember the senior hockey guys were holding down jobs. They, uh, you know, had families, they had kids or they were in school. So to balance all that was, it was very, very different at that era. Hmm. Did he ever see anything inconsistent in leading a good Christian life, so-called, and doing what sometimes has to be done in order to win hockey games? Uh, I honestly believe that, I mean, he, he loved to play tough. I mean, he was the quarterback of the football team at St. Mike's, and he actually he loved football more than he liked hockey. He always used to say if he had bigger hands, he would have, he would have played in the CFL as the quarterback. Uh, but he loved a tough game. He, it had to be a clean hit. had to be heads up. Uh, he, I think he instilled in many of the players, even my nephews or my, uh, my cousins, uh, you know, we're all taught growing up how to take and receive a hit going into the corners, heads up, but it was a respect. It was the discipline of the game. And, uh, so he didn't really care much for the, for the dirty part of the game. And I think most of the players, uh, I would say all the players understood that about his game, uh, the discipline he expected, and somehow he he evoked that uh, that leadership quality that players just they would go into battle with him, they would go to war for him. I asked Dave Keon this question, so I'm going to ask you as well. Dave Keon uh, uh, told us earlier tonight he got into one fight in his 20 plus years in the NHL and WHA. One fight. Do you know whether Father Dave ever dropped the gloves? I don't think he ever did. <laughs> we know, I mean, we see all the evidence everywhere about his hockey acumen. Did you ever see him acting as a priest? Constantly, every day. What does that mean? Um, hockey was just a vehicle. 
uh, you know, uh, the game was to build character. Uh, it was it was part of growing up, uh, getting your education, having something to fall back on. He wasn't against pro hockey. He was against pro hockey without a without a a, a plan B, not a plan Bauer, but a plan B, and that was generally an education, something to fall back on. And uh, he uh, he instilled that in everybody. And I think. Uh, uh, he, he wasn't one that, you know, as a Catholic priest, he wasn't trying to convert anybody. And there were many, I mean, Jim Gregory, they used to nickname him the Pope when he would go over to the gardens, but uh, it was always because he was on a mission from Father Dave. But uh, uh, he, um, he lived a life through example and um, he didn't care what you believed as long as you believed. Uh, and we're good to your fellow man. And uh, he definitely uh, would intrigue your mind. If, if, if he saw somebody struggling, he had a way of, of pulling that person out of the crowd, talking to them. Uh, and, you know, it didn't matter whether it was a head of state or somebody driving a Zamboni or Olympia machine or, or the guy shining the shoes on the street. I mean, he had, he had the ability to when he was speaking to you, you knew that you were the only person in the room. Hmm. Now, uh, St. Mike's has put more than 6,000 kids through their hockey program. I mean, it's been one of clearly the most successful junior hockey programs in the history of the country. And I wonder, ha have you ever thought about what St. Mike's hockey would have been like if Father David Bauer didn't come along? Well, you know, I, I think he, he definitely was part of it. And I think the 61 was was the marquee because you know hockey was turning to be a business uh, these teams were all feeders to the nhl the conflict was in players being poached into the league prematurely without their education so if there was a battle or a struggle going on within saint mike's within hockey at that time it's very similar to today i mean kids kids are being watched very at a young age right and uh you want them to have something to fall back on. Back then, they didn't make a lot of money, so if they did get hurt, uh, their their futures were in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. EJ, to the best of my knowledge, there are at least two major hockey arenas in this country named after your uncle. Have you been to them? Yes. What's it like to look at the outside of that arena and see that name up there on the side of a building? I, I would say for uh, for my cousins, uh, for for my kids, uh, uh, for his for Father Dave's siblings, there was you know a tremendous sense of pride and recognition of what he had contributed to the game. Uh, for Father Dave, not so much. He really didn't care for you know a name on a building, um, a book, a movie. None none of that appealed to him. Uh, he was very quiet. He was very humble, uh, somewhat reflective and, and uh, withdrawn. He was there when he needed to be, but he had a very con uh, contemplative life as well. Hmm. I want to ask you um, a kind of a challenging last question here, if I can, EJ. Sure. And that is, you know, for a man who dedicated his life uh, to doing so much good for others, he died relatively young. Did you ever have any conversations with him about that? Wow. <laughs> well, um, I was I was seeing a gal, and I was, of course, Father Dave didn't much care for the winter. And back in the day, uh, Para Murray tried to get him to move the national team out to Wilcox, and Father Dave wasn't much for the cold. So when he was sentenced out to UBC after they pulled out a 61 out of, out of junior A, uh, you know, he didn't mind the West at all. And of course they didn't think father Dave could get any trouble out there because there weren't too many ranks and hockey wasn't a real thing, but that changed pretty quickly. Um, so fast forward, uh, I was out there and, and my sister Barb told me, she said, I need you to go check in on FD. Uh, he's at the UBC hospital and he's not, doing great. He's going through some tests and stuff. And 
So uh, this was after the Olympics and um, he had been diagnosed, our, our family didn't know at the time, but uh, with pancreatic cancer. And um, so I would go see him every day. And this went on for two and a half, three, almost three weeks. And I think there were times where he didn't want to talk. And there were other times that he would want to talk. And this particular day, he just said, hey, E, you need to take my car. You need to buzz off, go up to Whistler, give me a couple of days. I need, I need to sort some things out. And uh, so in the end, he, he said, but before you go, I want to give you something. And so I, I said, well, what's that? He says, hold out your hand. And I, he gave me a rosary. And he, as the rosary dropped in my hand, he says, I know you don't know what to do with it, but maybe someday you will. And at that particular moment in time, there was a knock at the door. And uh, these three little nuns dressed like Mother Teresa came in and said, Reverend Father David Bauer? Yes. Mother Teresa asked us to stop in and say a prayer with you. And... Father Dave's own brothers and sisters didn't really know he was in the hospital. So the news traveled around the world. Father Dave traveled around the world, but uh, his faith uh, was evident in everything that he did. EJ, that's a phenomenal story. Thank you for sharing that with us and the rest of your memories of your uncle and keeping his legacy going. We're really grateful you could join us tonight. Yeah, I really appreciate you having us. And I know... Uh, you know, we had, we had a lot of different hockey teams and players and everything go through the house over the years. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I, I, I remember, and it just rings so loud and clear, is if there were all the players that played for Father Dave, he had an impact on every single one of them. And I think that's a real testament because I know a lot of guys from my generation that played junior and there weren't too many coaches that had that type of impact on them. And uh, to the fact that they would follow them halfway around the world, like Ricky, Terry, and Barry. So uh, anyway, Steve, thanks very much for having me. And uh, it, was a, it was a good night. A delight. Thanks, EJ. Yes. Be well. Okay, thank you. Take care. Well, we are almost at the end of our program this evening, at least this part of the program, before we move over to Zoom and do some uh, more informal Q&A. Uh, we wanted before finishing up to remind everybody that, of course, the St. Mike's hockey program wasn't just the Junior A majors, which won those four Memorial Cups and which has been the focus of so much of our conversation tonight. Uh, but there was another team there, too, the St. Michael's Buzzers. And they were a great hockey team as well. And we have two representatives of the Buzzers who are going to join us. And we're going to come full circle here because Kevin Burkett is going to join us from Brampton. And he was one of them. And this other fellow, who we've already met this evening, Dave Keon, also played for the Buzzers when he first came to St. Mike's. So let me start with this. How well do you two know each other from back in the day? Um, we, well, we, knew know, each other. we knew each other, but not well. But I should say, last fall, Dave's grandson uh, stayed with us through the fall uh, while he was playing Tier 2 here in the city. He did that. Is he a chip he, off his grandfather's block? Yes. He is. He's trying. <laughs> Great. He's trying. He's trying. Kevin, why don't you talk to us about how you ended up with the buzzers? Uh, this would be back in, uh, what, 1960? 61. Well, the buzzers was comprised of uh, uh, a number of players who had been brought in by the Leafs, uh, Gary Deneen, Gary Smith, Rod Sealing, some of those players. But there was a group that had come up. We started together as Bantams and moved up through the ranks. Tommy Polonic, Mike Savage, Mike Corbett, myself, Paul Cassidy, Pete Spire. And uh, the two groups kind of melded for that particular year. It was, a, it was a special year. Who was your coach? Father Bill Conway, very special individual. What made him special? He was a man who, uh, his X's and O's, probably came from Father Bauer, uh, but his ability to lead and to uh, inspire uh, was second to none. Uh, just picking up on the point you raised with uh, EJ in your last interview, which was terrific, um, about the tension between doing what has to be done to win and uh, Christian values. Uh, two, uh, two incidents come to mind. Uh, one, uh, 
uh, we'd had a, we were a young team, mostly 17 year olds. Uh, and we're playing a, a, a game in Lakeshore, mostly 20 year olds that particular week. It was a very rough physical game with a lot of fights and whatnot. And with, with Lakeshore coming back to, uh, to St. Mike's on the Friday night and our principal father, Sheedy, uh, laid down the law. There was to be no fights, no retaliation, no, nothing that would, uh, that can kind of besmirched the, the the reputation of the school, and uh, that game started. And Father Conway was a big, tall guy. He wore a fedora. Probably saw in some of those pictures. And uh, as the game went on, they were taking every advantage. And Big Tommy Polonic was a, our toughest guy. He kept looking over at the bench, and finally, Father Conway, notwithstanding what had been laid down by the principal, took his fedora and pulled it down over his eyes, and. Uh, that was the signal that we could play uh, uh, hit for hit and bump for bump. <laughs> the the other one, uh, the Marlies, which was the Weston Dukes, Ron Ellis, Britt Selby, they had a very good team. And their tough guy, mirroring Roger Cote, who was referred referred to by Dave earlier, the tough guy in that team was a, Dave Cull a guy named Dave Cullimore, number four. And I'll never forget to this day, it, it's just so vivid in my mind, Father Conway came in between the, at the start of the game and uh, he used to walk up and clap his hands. And that particular night, it was the last game of the season, regular season against Weston at St. Mike's, a small rink. And he started, our toughest guy was Tommy Polonic. He says, Tom, are you listening? Number four, Cullen Moore, I want him crucified. Oof. Tommy, are you listening? And then he went around, Mike, Mike Corbett, Ray, Ray DuPont, uh, went around, Emil, Emil Terrian, whose son Chris had a good NHL career. Are you listening? I want him crucified tonight. And he, he was hit so many times in that game. I can tell you that when we played them in the playoffs a few weeks later, uh, he was not a factor. And that was Father, Dave, Father uh, Bill Conway at his very best. Did you find his use of the word crucified somewhat uh, ironic Some, for a religious school? Somewhat, somewhat <laughs> shocking. But somewhat shocking. It got, it got everybody's everybody's <laughs> attention. Just before I move on, I should also say Rod Sealing was the only non-Catholic on the team that year. And <laughs> Father Conway had a thing before big games. We, we had a prayer to be said before every game. And before big games, he would say, Rod, you lead us in the prayer. And Rod would stumble around and everybody would be smirking and smiling. And as we go out on the ice, everybody would have a big smile on their face. And I'm sure that was done to uh, kind of lighten the, the mood and have us go out relaxed and play better. But I'll never, Rod, you lead us in prayer. And uh, <laughs> that was done before a lot of big games. So that was Father Bill Conway. Father Bill had a sense of humor, no doubt about it. Nice Dave Keon, did you play for him as well? No, I played for Father Flanagan, Father Ted Flanagan. He was our coach then. He was a, um, I think he was a football coach in the 40s and 50s. And he did coach a minor, high, uh, not the A's. He never coached the A's, but I think he coached the B's and maybe the midgets and uh, juveniles. And just to be clear, you started with the buzzers before going to the majors. Is that right? Yes, I did. How many games with uh, the buzzers would you have played? I think we played a 24 game schedule that year. And then uh, the next year when I went to junior way, we played 56. Whew. Big jump up. So it was a big jump up. Yeah. How what many are your memories you play? of playing yeah. for the buzzers? Oh, good memories. We, um, I guess it was a forerunner of what happened in 1961 because we won the Metro league and uh, we beat Dixie out in seven games. And we were going to go to play Kingston in the Eastern Division. And they told us that because of the schedule, we weren't going to play anymore. So Dixie went on, beat Kingston, and then beat Sarnia and won the, uh, won the All-Ontario Junior B. So that was, we, we, that was a disappointment. Hmm. We may have a couple of guys waiting in the wings who you may know from 60 years ago. Bill Crawford is here with us tonight. And Skip Stanowski is with us here tonight. Skip. Skip. Gentlemen, are you with us? Bill. There's Bill. Uh, yeah. There's, there's Bill. Skip. Yeah. And there's Skip. There we are. Yeah. 
<laughs> by book. Now, yeah. let, let's find this out. Skip and Bill, have you guys remained friends over the years for over the last 60? Yes, we have. We play golf regularly every summer. And uh, yeah, we keep in touch. And Bill, you, uh, what years did you play with the buzzers? Uh, I was the elder statesman of the team. Uh, I played uh, three years. So the last year was 61, 62. My first year was uh, with Jerry Cheevers and Butch McGee, who uh, David knows well. And uh, and my next year I played with uh, uh, Billy McMillan, who went on to a, a great NHL career. And who was your, was uh, Father Conway father, your coach? Father Bill Conway was the coach every year. So I knew all his strategies. Gotcha. And what position did you play? I played left wing. How'd you do? Uh, good. Yeah, I was primarily a checker, but I guess I got, uh, you know, 20 goals uh, a year. So uh, that was average for, um, for a second line left winger or, our premier line was uh, uh, Gary Deneen and uh, Rod Sealing, who went on to a great career, and Mike Corbett. And Mike Corbett, I think, was our best player. He was the most talented. He just didn't know when he was going to show up. Uh, <laughs> he was very erratic in his behavior. Now, did you ever hear your coach say, we got to crucify these guys tonight? The first time I heard it was tonight. I must have had the Walkman on or something. <laughs> but, now, did you? Uh, no, I, uh, but I do remember the game. I do remember the game uh, uh, because the next game, uh, a guy by Rick, by the name of Rick McLaughlin, who played for Lakeshore, um, uh, was after Jim McKinney, uh, Jim McKendry, God bless him. And he uh, he had two broken fingers and he had a cast on. And uh, and uh, Rick McLaughlin chased them around the length of the ice three times. And finally, Gary Smith stepped in and gave him a straight arm and knocked him down. But uh, anyway, there, yeah, it was a different show every night in the, in the Junior B, but it was exciting, yeah. It's funny what you remember all these years later. Yeah, huh? that's right. And, you know, the players never talked about the streak. Um, Father Conway... Uh, at the end of um, January, there was only four league games left. And he had a meeting on a Saturday morning, uh, asked us all to come in, and we couldn't figure out uh, why. Uh, anyway, we all met on the Saturday morning, and he talked about, uh, he congratulated us on how we were doing. But he said the real season starts in two weeks from now, and that was the playoffs. And the playoffs in junior hockey, as you know, is sudden death. And so he wanted us mentally prepared, just like Father Bauer. Uh, they were very mentally uh, 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 conscientious with us and uh, want us to, to be mentally prepared, which we were. Now, Kevin, were you and Bill teammates back in the day? Yeah, we were that yes. year. Uh, we were on that same team, the buzzer team. Uh, just, a, just a Mike Corbett story when Bill said you didn't know quite when he was going to show up. Bill will remember the night in Aurora where Corby had been some out for a few games. He came back and he, he starts getting dressed and then he's going around the room looking at everybody's bag. And Father Conway comes in and says, what's going on here? And uh, he had to acknowledge that he'd forgotten his skates and he was hoping they were in somebody else's bag. And Father Conway said, I don't know how you're getting home, but you're not getting home on the bus. So, <laughs> How about <laughs> Kevin? Tell him the one about the sticks. Oh, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> oh, oh, I think we do well, now. Sticks, we, had, well, we, we, had a, we had a trainer named Mike Maville, who it, it is uh, infamous. And anyway, he controlled the sticks, and there were Mike Corbett had, well, tens of sticks. Oh, hidden in his basement, courtesy of Maville. And one night, I think it was both Father Bauer and Father Conway showed up at his house and insisted they could go down the, somebody tipped them off down the basement and they cleaned out the, the, the sticks he'd hoarded away in the basement, which were team sticks. Anyway. <laughs> he was running his own little racket there, was he? <laughs> he, he was. I should, <laughs> was I should also say he decided... 
this is Corbett, he decided it would be a good idea to, he kind of invented the pregame skate. He thought it would be a great idea to skate and get himself warmed up. So he used, there was a, a natural ice rink, Wells Hill across from the school. He'd go over there in the afternoon and and warm himself up. But one day he, he obviously took the edge off his blade and he, he skated out for the game. He could hardly stand up. And from that day on, Father Conway had custody of his skates. He'd bring them to practice so Corby could skate. He'd bring them to games, but Mike never had control of his own skates from that day on. <laughs> Father Conway had them. <laughs> Dave Keon, you looked like you wanted to add something to that. <laughs> He'll have some Corby stories, I'm sure. No, they, they, they showed a picture of it. They, they, they took a picture. They showed a picture of their team, and Mike Mivel was... Mivel was right in the middle of it. I don't know if you saw him there. <laughs> That's right. Let me just see if we can get Glenn to bring that picture back up again, and maybe you guys can can show us some of the teammates. Let's see. Glenn, if we got that picture standing by, can we bring that one back up? There we go. Oh, that's the, that's the year before. Oh, this is when uh, – uh, this is when we – that's in 56, 57. There it is, right Jerry there. Jerry and uh, – Oh, there he is. There he is. There it is. Rod Sealing. He's in front Sealing. of Gary Smith, Sealing, Deneen. Yeah. Miv, Gary. Miv is right in the middle. Yeah. Who's the captain? Gary Deneen. Gary Deneen's the captain. there's Corby in the back there. Yeah. There's Jimmy McKendry. Yeah. Yep. Ricky Noonan. Who's passed away. And there's Billy Crawford off to yep. the uh, far right. Now, who's the fella in the middle with the uh, team jacket on who looks a lot shorter than everybody else? Mike Maville, the trainer. <laughs> okay. Mike Maville, the stick boy. <laughs> who has gotcha. life of his own. <laughs> Ten years in high school. <laughs> <laughs> he liked it so much, he just kept going and going and going, eh? <laughs> Bill, let me ask you this question. How important was St. Mike's to you in terms of not just your athletic, but your development as a person? Oh, uh, Very important. I didn't recognize it at the time, uh, uh, but I was brought up by a, a single parent. And uh, the male influence that St. Mike's had me uh, was quite impactful in the discipline of life. And, uh, yeah, I thank them every day. Am I allowed to follow up and ask why you were in a single parent household? Uh, my mother uh, uh, ran a nursing home in the in the forties and the fifties, and uh, always wanted me to to go to St. Mike's. St. Mike's was the school to go to, and I was uh, born and raised in Toronto, so uh, uh, I loved to play hockey. So uh, that's where I ended up, and. Uh, uh, and I've got a lot of friends from St. Mike's. He always run into uh, people. Uh, I was uh, I was a Toronto Star employee in advertising for uh, almost 40 years. So I ran into a lot of people. And uh, some of them remember uh, the hockey back when, uh, when St. Mike's had the junior teams. And as uh, uh, David alluded to, the double headers, you know, that was a, a big thing that Alan Lamport allowed in the in the fifties. Lampy, yeah, they were well attended. Yeah, uh, they were. Uh, I guess the only guy that didn't go into the rink on Sunday, uh, David, maybe you know about this. Hap M's. He was the owner coach of uh, of the Barry Flyers, but he always sat out. <laughs> Barry. He always <laughs> sat out on Church yeah. Street and listened to it on the radio because. Uh, he never he never went to a game on Sunday. I, I Roger it. Nielsen Roger Nielsen was the same. Was he? Oh yeah. yeah. I, didn't know. I didn't know that. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for doing this for us this but evening. On, it on, has Dave, Go ahead, Dave Keon, if you want to finish that, go ahead. No, I was gonna say on, on Sunday afternoons at the double headers, they were they were big things. They put twelve thousand people in there on a Sunday afternoon. There was nothing else going on in Toronto. So everybody went to see, you know, the junior Canadians had come to town. Uh, Marley's, St. Mike's, St. Catharines, Guelph. So it was a big thing. And uh, 
Uh, I remember the first time I went, you know, walked in the junior game and there's 12,000 people there. It was, uh, hmm. it was very exciting. Hmm. Well, as sometimes happens in National Hockey League games, after a tie, they go into overtime, and we did this evening too. We had a little bit of overtime, but I think it was worth it because we love getting these stories from you gentlemen tonight. So my job is now to throw things over to Larry Cole, who's going to finish it off for us this evening. Larry, if you would. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for a magnificent uh, job of hosting our first part of the StreamYard session. Uh, we're going to now pivot to the um, Zoom session, which is more interactive uh, so that uh, 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 be more people on screen at one time can interact with people. We have uh, many uh, guests waiting in the wings, including Jerry Cheevers, who's trying to phone in from Florida tonight. So hopefully we can get Jerry uh, is try will phone in during the Zoom part. We also have, uh, of course, many alumni from the school uh, and other players from the majors and buzzers. For example, Paul Conlon. Uh, we have Billy McMillan. We have Rick Noonan, who is the manager of the 61 majors team with uh, Jim Gregory. Uh, and we have uh, some uh, famous alumni, uh, uh, including the greatest ball hockey player of all time from St. Mike's, Ted Schmidt. So we have a lot of people waiting in the wings uh, uh, on the Zoom session. So uh, we're going to pivot now uh, to the uh, Zoom session. And so uh, click on your links uh, uh, to, to go to Zoom, uh, said that there'll be uh, the opportunity uh, for more interaction. I'd like to thank all the guests uh, from the first part of the show with, the, with these wonderful stories. And and now going to uh, switch to the Zoom part um, if someone will help me <laughs> and uh, move 